It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, mate. And uh, I wanted to ask you about your own cultural journey, which you've been walking most of your life uh, as a bridge between two cultures and as the indigenous peoples, really pioneering the first major settlement with the crown in many ways. I think my most powerful cultural formative factors were my, uh, my Pākehā father right. and a uh, uh, Toa, my Ngāitahu grandmother. It's a bit unfair to all the other people who shaped the uh, life of a, um, a boy who was essentially, well, I had two adoptive a brother, adopted brother and a sister, but I was essentially an only child mm. from mm. early on. And from my Tawa, my Naitahu mother's, uh, grandmother's point of view, I was the uh, firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn, and uh, I uh, was consequently treated uh, with a ridiculous amount of uh, attention. And my father was a uh, something of a polymath. He was a student of everything and uh, he was a very senior and very talented surgeon. Had had a uh, quite a significant role in the evolution of uh, uh, World War II and post-World War II surgical techniques and methods. He was examiner in surgery, a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeon and all those things. But he was interested in port development and town planning and uh, you name it, he was mad on it. He was an enthusiastic uh, uh, botanist and interested in New Zealand native plants, uh, Maori place names, uh, all sorts of things. And he was also <coughs> a, a, a favourite of this uh, rather inspiring and powerful grandmother, Naitahu grandmother of mine, who was a stalwart of the Naitahu claims uh, over seven generations long, and she was be about generation five, and uh, yes, I was generation so five. So you stood right in the middle of all and of these So courses. I sat in the middle of these sorts mm. of things. And what did you learn? I learned very early about the nature of uh, a view, anyhow, of the Naitahu claims, but essentially it was delivered to me through a typically Keynesian lens of my father's uh, because he regarded it as a gross uh, criminal economics, as he called it, uh, disinheritance by inflation. So how, did, how does this different history, how did that affect the settlement process? Because you were very successful there, and so I'm wondering about the skills that I don't think it, is needed. I don't think it settled it. It was my personal... There's a series of events. Uh, Harold Macmillan once said, uh, when asked by some fawning person at an uh, 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 academic meeting somewhere, else, what did he think was the great determinant of political decision making? Uh, he triggered his moustache, he said, circumstances, dear boy, circumstances. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a conjunction of circumstances that um, were happening. The driving thing that made it possible for me to work differently, I think I probably had a deeper understanding because of the background I'd had. I had a deeper and earlier understanding of the emergent circumstances in New Zealand. I was very conscious of the fact that my father's generation had been sitting on a demographic bomb but not understood it. Their solutions were all 1930s solutions. Ralph Hannon and all those mm. people. The Hun Report. What was the demographic bomb? Well, the demographic bomb was the explosion of the Maori population from 1929 uh, until quite recently, Maori have exceeded every census projection mm. made for them. Um, so you weren't dying? <laughs> well, no. No, but what was interesting was that in the period post-war, New Zealand Māori had the highest birth rate of any ethnic group on earth, including China, including Rio de Janeiro, uh, Bombay, and sort of, yeah. And it was only for a short burst, but that's the pulse we're still getting. Mm, mm. 
in the population. It's aging now. It's true. The European population is certainly aging. Well, well Māori, Māori, Māori are, still everyone's young. aging, but the, well, Māori but Māori are uh, still predominantly. So of course we, 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 we we've, we're sitting on another demographic bomb. At Absolutely. The and the question is how the cultural capability that most Pākehā have had to acquire to, to get on and understand treaty issues because it's become fundamental to the economy, it's become fundamental to who the customers are and who the workforce is, how that translates really when you're now dealing with a, a, a multicultural a multicultural society. Um, it's an interesting set of conundrums. Uh, Tarangiho of Tuhoi would have said that too. He said the, the big issue in this society is not Māori and Pākehā, it's Māori and Māori. Mm. And uh, it's quite an interesting perspective. Now, I don't entirely agree with it, but I think we're moving too fast for those luxurious sort of uh, indulging ourselves in mm. those sorts of uh, approaches. But You've got a, um, an interesting set of questions uh, coming because we're on a, another big demographic transformational shift. We're still exceeding those earlier projections. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a situation at the half century which is uh, with nearly twice, a bit less than twice as many New Zealanders as there are now. The dominant uh, Pākehā grouping is going to be older. It's going to be living on taxes generated by people who are on the whole non-Pākehā and younger, mm. which in itself is an interesting mm. uh, element in the forward view of the chemical. Well, politically, the chemist, politically. in terms of yeah. power and the making of policy, in your right. own self-interest. Absolutely. Uh, it doesn't work that well for the ageing European population. Absolutely. Because, you know, by 2038, mm. even, the Stats New Zealand is saying that 51% of New Zealand will be identifying their ethnicity as Asian, 21%, mm. then Māori, 19.5%, and then the rest Pacifica to make up 51%. Mm. So... Yeah, well, it, it's quite interesting. What those, what the concepts of ethnicity are also going to mean in mm. that framework. That's true. What they've meant in my life uh, have been primarily Naitahu. When I was at secondary school, the school was dominated by um, uh, Peter Fraser's Polish refugees. They were most of them neo fascist Catholics. Because I was the only person of uh, Maori descent, I was rather more olive than I am now. Um, I was associated with all the Island Bay fishermen's sons, and so I became the leader of an Italian schoolyard so gang. So when you look back and you look forward, uh, the cultural capability of the country has progressed a little bit, I think, because of the need Oh yes, I, I was at dinner last evening. Treaty. I was at dinner last evening in the Northern Club with, uh, I described it when I looked at those assembled around the top table as... <coughs> I was sitting next to Don McKinnon, if there's any indication of what I'm talking about. I said, this is not so much a reunion, but an exhumation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, but the conversation around the table could not have been held 30 years ago. Uh, and why is that? Because of the experience the society's gone through, as a consequence of the... Uh, treaty negotiation settlement process, the understanding and dialect. I think we were talking about this last night and Pat Snedden was saying that in his view the uh, work of the Waitangi Tribunal over time has been enormously powerful. Now it's not often the mix that's gone to make New Zealand And its diversity is not well understood within New Zealand. And I think there's been a, there was in the 19, uh, late 60s, early, mid 60s, when Mervyn Wellington was the Minister of Education, 
is a deliberate attempt to wipe out civics and New Zealand history from the school curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's now being quietly reintroduced mm -hmm. to some extent as a consequence of that constitutional advisory. We need to bring the interview to a close, but do you want then to comment on the lack of cultural capability, which is what your last example really was all about? <coughs> Certainly when I came to this country, the questions I was asked about where I'd come from uh, displayed a, a large amount of ignorance. Have we got a lesser level of cultural competencies? I think majority cultures think they're normal. They, but on the whole, they think they don't have to be articulated. But that element is a huge, that's the greatest weakness in cultural capability is because on the whole, they don't think culturally. Hmm. And de developing cultural capability is not necessarily having them understand the minorities or the different perspectives and ethnic viewpoints such as you and I might represent. The greatest challenge is getting them to, in Aristotle's terms, know thyself, know themselves. Mm. And that's a great point to, to, to end. Thank you so much, Sir Tiffany. Uh, I'm very grateful for your insight, which I think I can summarise as saying that we need to understand our own history and our own culture in order to appreciate other people's cultures and history. Absolutely. That's fundamental. Hey, Connor.